Chris uh, for the for the YouTube as well. So let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker is Chris Jordan. He's a visual artist uh, and photographer. He's actually an internationally acclaimed photographer and filmmaker whose works are exhibited and published worldwide. Uh, his work walks the fine line between beauty and despair while exploring the dark undercurrents of our consumer culture's focus on disposable goods and mass consumption. Chris's first foray into the subject was the project Intolerable Beauty, which demonstrated the enormous amount of waste in various areas throughout Seattle. His next project, Running the Numbers, used innovative perspectives to illustrate the vast magnitude of our mass consumption. Chris's largest project to date is a series of photographs, Midway, Message from the Gyre, and the companion film, Albatross. The project was inspired by a stunning environmental tragedy that's taking place on the tiny atoll in the North Pacific Ocean. He and his team photographed and filmed thousands of young albatrosses that lay dead on the ground, their stomachs filled with plastic, underscoring the destructive power of our culture of consumption and our, da our damaged relationship with the living world. Uh, if you've seen any of Chris's uh, or Chris's most recent TED talk, I think from last year, uh, you may note that he's um, talked a lot more uh, recently, I think about the beauty that we see in the world and, and thinking about those, those, taking those messages of beauty into account in his art and his representations as well. And so his, uh, his uh, uh, presentation today Grief, Beauty, and Statistics, The Power of Art in Environmental Communication. I think he'll be focusing on a variety of topics. And with that, I would like to welcome Chris uh, today. Let's go ahead and give him a round of applause, both virtual and real. I oh. like to see us do that. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, maybe be, as we get started, you can let us know, Chris, how you would like to take questions. You want us to save our questions till the end, or do you want us to give you questions throughout? You tell us what you'd like. Well, um, my biggest interest is to talk about what you guys are most interested in and what you've most been talking about and like what you're most engaged with. So send the questions, let's make it super informal. Okay. Um, I was thinking I would go through uh, some of those bodies of work and talk a little bit about some of the philosophies of it. But um, as soon as you start asking questions, I'll turn toward that material. And I already see a really interesting question from someone. Um, oftentimes when one experiences true beauty and magnificence, they feel grounded or humbled somehow. Have you ever had such a moment when taking photos? And if so, what was the story behind it? Oh man, ha. well, <laughs> that's really funny because that's the experience that I'm having right now in my work. And um, I want to take you a little bit on the journey uh, from where I started to get to now, um, starting looking at horror and looking into the darkness and, uh, and my, my arc, like for the last 25 years or so has been slowly moving through that material. And I feel like I'm finally coming out the other side um, and where I am right now, I'm in, I'm in Chile in the state of Patagonia and I've been filming and photographing here in the, in the famous Atacama Desert and the Altiplano at super high altitude. And that experience of just seeing the enormity of those landscapes and the, the incredible silence out there and being there at night um, in where you can vividly see our galaxy with the naked eye um, is exactly that experience of the, the, the astronomers call the overview effect just this incredible sense of awe and amazement. Um, so yes, I have lots of stories of that, <laughs> um, but let's rewind a little bit because I wanna take you back to a bunch of giant piles of garbage. <laughs> 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 let's go there first. So I'm gonna hit share screen and But I wanna go kind of fast through the visual stuff because there's so much to talk about. Um, so this is the work that I was doing back in uh, the, let's see, mid nineties, um, when I first got interested in the subject of mass consumption. And I, uh, I started just traveling all over through the port of Seattle. Back then it was open, it was before 9-11. So you could just drive right in there and walk around and take, photos of anything. 
Um, and I, what I was fascinated with was trying to face the enormity of our mass consumption and, and to, uh, to, to try to comprehend it. It was like the, the experience of it for me was like for my entire life, I'd been living in Disneyland and now I got to go behind the ride and see the scary oily machine that's running it. And the, as I did this work, I also, um, I, kept, uh, I kept the aesthetic of it firmly grounded in beauty. And that's why I call this series Intolerable Beauty. It's like whatever ugly stuff we encounter in the world, there's always a beauty to it. And I just love working with, with subjects that if you only look at the color, then it, it has this, this gorgeousness to it. It's like a Monet painting. And then if you look at this, the thing that you're actually looking at is this horrible subject. And I just love how those two things kind of crash together. And it's been a theme in my work for, for my whole life. Giant pile of glass. And as I did this work, I began to read more and more about our culture of mass consumption. And it was like waking up from the matrix. You know, I, I began to see more clearly this vast machine that we're all part of, that we're all contributing to, that each one of us is too small to, to make a difference in, on the global scale. And yet we all know we are making a difference and just trying to figure out how do you face this thing and not be crushed by it? How do we face our complicity and how can we change? How, what's a way that, that we can change it? And the more that I studied it and, and learned about the environmental tragedies and, and the destruction that is being caused by our mass consumption, then my vision of it began to get darker and kind of more visceral. And I got, I got really interested in e-waste. So I started traveling to places where they process electronic waste. Um, and even like the most horrible pile of cell phone or phone chargers and batteries and wires and stuff just had a, a, a strange kind of amazing visceral beauty to it. If you can't see on your screen, that's lots and lots of cell phones. That's a few thousand phones. And at the time, that was the, the largest number of phones I could get myself in front of. Like I wanted to go to the place where all of our garbage goes. Like where's the biggest possible pile of garbage to go take a photograph of that? And I learned, of, of course, that our garbage doesn't all go to one place. Like all of the phones that we use, the hundreds of thousands of phones that are being thrown out every day, never go to one place. And all of our waste is like that. It's spread out into multiple streams. And so we can't ever see the full phenomenon of our mass consumption. There's nowhere you can go and experience it with your senses. And so what we're stuck with is trying to understand those phenomena using abstract information like numbers, like giant statistics of, of like the number of phones we use. It's um, 130 or 140 million phones per year are thrown out in the United States. And this is just a few thousand. This is like a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. And as a photographer, I was frustrated, like where, how can I make photographs that show the actual scale because the phenomenon itself is invisible to us. It's inaccessible. And just as I, I just had an, an exhibition of this work in New York and that's when Hurricane Katrina happened. So I took off for New Orleans um, and I wanna just briefly, quickly show you some of the work that I did there And one of the, the themes that I'm always coming back to in my work is, is grief. 
It's to feel our sadness for what is being lost, to really connect with, with our feeling. And that was the kind of the central experience that I had photographing the devastation of Hurricane Katrina was just this incredibly deep sadness the symbolism of what was lost. 130,000 people lost everything they owned, including their homes and Okay, so let's see. I think I'm going to pop out for a sec and just check the chat. Um, are there any new questions? Uh, yeah, Chris, it looks like you do have a, a couple of questions, I think. Um, Caitlin Gray asked the question, uh, was there a singular product that was the most staggering to see at such a large scale? Oh. Some, some product of our consumption that just when seen, just the magnitude was just overwhelming to you. Oh, well, God, there's so many. <laughs> there was never a time when I got to be in front of a, a quantity that blew my mind because those quantities just don't exist anywhere. But there are two that I think of that, that every time I think of this, it just knocks me over again. And I'll show you this one. I'm going to jump forward. Too. This is this, the series that I call Running the Numbers. Um, well, actually, let's see. I'll just dive in and I'll get, I'll get to that question because it's just like a couple more images in. Okay. So when, uh, when I was at that cell phone facility, um, I had an idea for a way to show a very large number of phones um, by creating a kind of digital construction. So I brought home a box of phones. The guy who ran that facility lent me a box of 400 phones and I dumped them on my studio table with a camera facing, set up the camera facing straight down on them and lit them. And that's what they look like. Um, can you see? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, okay. Um, so that's about, I can't remember, like 200 phones or so. And so I, then I stirred the phones around and I took the same picture again, and then I could stitch those two pictures together. And I just did that manually in Photoshop. And, then, and so I took several hundred photographs of the same phones over and over and, and then just stitched and stitched and stitched. And I kept track of the quantity as I went until finally, let's see, is that the last one? Yeah, that's the last one. I had this super giant Photoshop canvas of 426,000 phones, which was the number of phones thrown out in the United States every day. And it had a cool feature, which is this image is ultra, ultra high resolution because every single one of the photos that I stitched was a high resolution like that. So this could be printed like six by eight feet with infinitesimally fine resolution that when you walk all the way up close and put your nose almost on the print, then you see every single detail of the phones. Um, and I started doing a whole series of those. So I went to my local supermarket and borrowed a hundred brown paper supermarket bags. And that's what, that's what those look like. I set them up on my table and just took a photograph of them. Then I stacked them into a different stack and took another photo. And then I started in Photoshop, started stacking those photographs and slowly built and kept track of the quantity. Whoops. Slowly built an image of 1.14 million brown paper supermarket bags, which is one hour of our brown paper supermarket bag consumption in the US. And then this next one, this is one of the, this is the statistic that just blows my mind is the number of cigarettes that are smoked and littered into the environment in the world. Hmm. This one represents a global statistic. The, the estimated number of cigarettes that are smoked every year in the world is 8 trillion. 
<laughs> which is just, that's an incomprehensibly huge number. It's like orders of magnitude beyond our ability to even comprehend how many that is. Um, and it's estimated that half of those are littered into the environment. And so 4 trillion cigarettes per year adds up to a little more than 100,000 cigarettes per second. So it's raining cigarettes in the world. And so uh, to make this image, I went to a bunch of bars um, up on Finney Ridge. I just like walked along to all of the bars and I gave them each a bag and I asked, can they dump all of their cigarette butts in there for a, a couple of weeks? And then I went and collected them. I had like a couple of shopping bags full of super gross cigarettes and brought them back to my studio and dumped them on the ground and <laughs> they smelled super horrible. And, uh, and then I, I photographed in little sections and started building this huge image of the number of cigarettes littered on, in, into the world's environments every second. And that was a photograph that I took uh, a few years previously. This one is, uh, it's plastic cups, the plastic, the, uh, an image that depicts the number of plastic cups used on airline flights. That I built that one in Photoshop as well. It's 1 million plastic cups, which is the number of plastic cups used on airline flights in the US every six hours. So it takes four of this photograph to show just the number of plastic cups consumed on airline flights in the US every day. Of course, that number is different right now because of, there, aren't, there aren't as many flights in the air. But one of the things that, that just kept coming up for me in, in this project is my astonishment at the difference between what I thought I comprehended a gigantic number like a million and then when I actually see how many it really is. And this is such an interesting thing in the field of environmental communication because so many of the phenomena that we are trying to communicate to each other about are these gigantic phenomena that there's no way to depict it other than with huge numbers. And we know from lots of different sociological studies, studies of the mind, that the human mind cannot comprehend numbers more than a few thousand. And then when you start going up by orders of magnitude from a few thousand to a few million and then to a few hundred million and then to billions and then hundreds of billions and so on, it's far, far beyond our ability to comprehend. And if we aren't comprehending it and we have no other information to try to comprehend it, then it's, it's a purely abstract thing in our mind and we don't feel anything. And this to me is, it's one of the, one of the, the missing pieces in our culture right now is, is it's so hard to feel something about these vast issues that are, that are so profoundly important for us to comprehend and feel something about. The extinction of species and the, the, the amount of plastic in the ocean. Like we have, to, we have to connect with those things on a deeper level than just abstract numbers that we can't even comprehend at all. And that's really the, the motivation behind all of this work. Went outside and pointed my camera up and took a bunch of pictures of planes flying overhead and then just cut them out in Photoshop and started pasting them all on top of each other and built an image of the actual number of jet flights in the US. This is, at the time, this was uh, eight hours of jet flights, but that number went way up um, since I made this piece. Now it's much lower because of the pandemic. Same thing with plastic bottles. This is 2 million plastic bottles, which is 15 minutes of our plastic bottle consumption in the US. And let's see, I think, let's stop there for a sec. How do I, I can't figure out how to unshare my screen. Now. Oh, uh, if you go to the very top, it should be able to unshare. I can also unshare you if you'd like. Oh yeah, once you do that, I can't find the, I hit a button and changed the format a little bit by accident. 
Okay, let me just. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Oh, I see a, those are a bunch of questions. You have a lot of questions right now. Okay, yes. let's go for some of those. Um, maybe Sean, do you want to choose choose one? Oh, or? there are there are some really good ones right now, um, but there are certainly uh, there's certainly quite a few. Um, well, here's you know, so you mentioned this idea of. Um, I think, let's see, you were talking about numbers and that I thought was really interesting. Uh, Maya mentions, okay, in your TED talk, turning powerful stats into art, you open with a photograph containing 1 million plastic cups, maybe the one you just showed us actually, and go to a panels of prison uniforms and a Van Gogh made of cigarettes. Mediums you chose and the issues they represented were so sim uh, symbiotic. How did you find the inspiration to create these pieces? Where does the inspiration to create sort of the, I mean, obviously you're dealing with these huge numbers, but then what you turn them into, where does that come uh, from? Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. Look, man, I'm just reading some of those other questions too. What a bunch of great questions. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Uh, each one of the running the numbers pieces, it's a, a really interesting puzzle. And I've always felt that it's sort of like solving a Rubik's cube. There's like there are lots of different sides because um, I, I know that it's going to be made of lots and lots of something small. So lots of individual phones or lots of individual aluminum cans or lots of Barbie dolls or something like that. And then I can build all of those smaller images into any big image that I want. And so, and, and my wish is is to build as many layers of meaning in there as I can, make it as as multi-layered as possible, um, and it, part of that is just to honor the complexity of those issues. Is to sort of be in the paradox of those issues, um, and uh, and just to make it an interesting experience for the viewer. And what I what I always want to happen with the the running the numbers pieces is. When you see it online, it's a it's a different experience than seeing the the actual prints, and they're made to be printed and shown in museums, even though the vast majority of people is, see them online. But when you see one in a museum, imagine this huge piece that might be like eight by twelve feet in size, and first of all, you you see it from a distance, and the experience that I want the viewer to have is to that it's something that's not threatening. So it's not like some horrible, terrible, shocking, it's, it's like a beautiful painting or just a big blue field of blue or a, a, something interesting and non-threatening. So that when you first encounter it, your defenses don't come up. And then you, you start to approach it and you see that there's these really fine, this texture, this details, and you get closer and closer and closer until, and all of the images are optimized so that you don't see what the small things are until you're just right in front of the piece. And then there's that sort of surprise, a little bit of shock is like, oh my God, it's all aluminum cans or it's all plastic bottles or whatever. And in that moment, then you're fully, your peripheral vision is fully taken up by the piece and you see the quantity, you, you comprehend the quantity. That's this incredibly huge number of these tiny plastic bottles. And maybe there's even a humor response, especially young kids, like kids in middle school who go, they all, they, they run around and look and when they get up close, they always laugh at what, at what the thing is. And only then, having comprehended the quantity, then they read the plaque, the wall plaque that says, this is how many plastic bottles we use every 10 seconds. Or this is how many birds are dying every day from exposure to commercial uh, agricultural pesticides. And then it's uh, hopefully that uh, when they read it, the, the, their defenses are still down and then they get that shock of comprehension. At least that's the, that's the wish. That's sort of like the, the deeper motivation behind all of those pieces. 
So sometimes it starts when I, I read a statistic. I just, I read some statistic that's just like, oh my God, it just breaks my heart. It's such a sad thing. Other time I think, okay, I want to make something out of ocean plastic. What should that be? Then I'm, I'm starting with whatever's the small thing. And then sometimes like I made uh, Picasso's blue nude out of plastic bottles as a way of, of showing the desecration of the divine feminine, the, the feminine grief, female grief, like mother earth, the grief of mother earth for, for, and so I started that one with Picasso's blue nude and I thought, okay, I want to use plastic bottles. So they each, each one of them starts in a different way. And then it's sort of like solving the, all the sides of the Rubik's cube. Wow. That's yeah, fascinating. Um, well, it was, there, you know, there are so many questions here. Is there, did you see another one that you wanted to, to hit um, right away? Let's see that well, there was one back there that, that asked about uh, substance abuse that really got me. Um, yeah, oh, I see. From, yeah, from your Teresa. work. Yeah, uh, you see that one. Okay. Your work captures both the beauty and cruel absurdity of our world and society. What connection or parallels do you see between substance use and abuse and our relationship with the environment? Like, oh, such a deep, courageous question. Um, I mean, it's, it's exactly the same thing, isn't it? It's, it's two forms of denial. That's the heart of what substance abuse is, is like a desire to escape from, from pain. And this, th that really goes to the heart of, I, I think it's been the deepest learning that I've experienced in the last 20 years of my work is what happened to me on Midway Island when I made my film Albatross. Um, and Teresa, if you haven't seen Albatross, um, watch Albatross, it's, it's free. It's, uh, it's available for free on our website. Um, and I went to Midway Island with exactly with that, that desire in mind is to get past my own denial and to fully feel my sadness for this one environmental tragedy that is happening out there, which is the birds whose bodies are filled with plastic. And the, the thing that was so shocking about that experience was how much grief I felt for, for birds whose bodies were dead birds. And they were a kind of bird that I never thought about in my whole life up until then. Albatrosses, we don't even, like they're just not even on our radar. And I'd seen thousands of images of gorillas and lions and you know, like and dolphins and albatrosses were just sort of just an idea. I had no idea that I cared about albatrosses and being there on that island and, and holding their bodies as they died and seeing them choke to death on a cigarette lighter and seeing their dead bodies on the ground filled with handfuls of just the stupidest plastic junk. It was a journey into grief that really made me understand how I had been trying to escape pain for my whole life. And it changed my relationship with pain forever. Because what I learned from that experience is like where I had always been grief averse. I didn't want to feel grief. I thought grief is the same as pain or the grief is the same as depression. And so if there was something that would make me feel grief, I would just want to avoid it, to, to not experience it or, or experience it as fast as possible and then be done with it. Just the same as, as if when we use a substance. So like just get away from reality, just somehow move reality over there. So for a little while. And I just couldn't do it on Midway Island. I, I, I tried to avoid it, but I couldn't because it was so powerful, it was so visceral and so in my face. And I would be with those birds 
as they died and every single time the tears would just pour down. And I don't know how many, uh, how many times I had that experience. It was hundreds of times that I was with those birds as they died. And I started having this experience of observing myself in that experience sort of like waking up from the matrix and seeing some, like standing back one layer. And, and I noticed that I was letting go of my judgment that it was a bad experience because it was just so incredibly vivid, an unbelievably powerful experience. Being with these birds in that sacred moment as they let go of life and knowing that they died because of our plastic was just so powerful. And the, the colors, like everything seemed super vivid and time felt like it slowed down. And it suddenly dawned on me one time that the reason that I feel so much, the reason the tears pour down every time is because I love them. And I realized that's what grief is, is it's not the same as sadness. It's not the same as depression. It's the same as love. And it liberated me to fully feel my own grief for, for everything that's happening in the world, stuff that happens in my own life and things that are happening on the bigger scale, just to fully feel that grief because it's not a hell hole that takes you into depression. It's a doorway that leads us home. And I realized that grief aversion or pain aversion, when we hold those things over there, the problem with that is that our love is over there too. Like that's where our soul is. So to not feel that, we have to separate ourselves from the most essential part of ourself. And that's the tragedy of substance abuse is for that little bit of time, there may be a feeling of whatever floatiness, like not, not having the pain that we don't want to have, but we also lose contact with the deepest part of ourself in that process. And that's why recovering from substance abuse is also the hardest thing to do is because you have to come back in contact with everything, with, with your whole life. But yeah, we, we are collectively in a state of denial. Like we're all addict, addicts when it comes to facing issues like climate change and, uh, and mass consumption. Yeah. I, I, yeah I'm, I'm seeing several questions, some questions on YouTube and some questions uh, in our chat that kind of fit in the same sort of uh, space. You're talking about the way that audiences are, are seeing this work and um, this, you mentioned this idea specifically about grief avoidance. And when somebody online mentioned this idea of it being, is this a, uh, an American propensity? Or as you've seen your audiences engage with your work uh, in other locations and other sort of cultural contexts, um, do people, do you see a commonality in the way, in the reactions that you receive? Mm. Well, yeah. and. Um... I never thought this would be what I do as an artist, but in, before the pandemic started for like the last maybe eight years, I've been traveling all over the world, showing my work. And, uh, and I, I had the amazing experience of attending screenings of Albatross all over the world. And I'm always surprised by how similar the response is everywhere. Um, but I would say that I think grief aversion, like the, the, that kind of disconnection the, uh, on a collective scale, the disconnection from, from deeper feeling is something that America suffers from maybe as badly as anywhere. Hmm. But it's not everyone. And that, you know, that's the thing, like when I go to a, a film festival, the people who come to the film festival are a very narrow slice of the of the the bigger population but i always find that the the kind of people who are willing to engage that deeply with with really challenging material that albatross is they 
the the response is always one where they're willing to go all the way and and feel it and that's been an, an incredibly inspiring thing to see yeah there's another thing though as well and and this is one of the the things i really wanted to talk with you guys about today so i think i'll just jump right in about that and that is I think in the world of environmentalism, I have, I've kind of had a front row seat for the environmental conversation for maybe the last 15 years um, in the US and around the world. And, and it's a, been an amazing privilege to see it, to go, I've, I've gone to all of the conferences and heard the, the top scientists and the top activists and the top advocates, read all their books, met them in person. I'm, I'm close friends with, with many of the world's leading environmental scientists from a bunch of different fields. And there's a, a, a way that the environmental conversation is fundamentally broken. And it, it took me a long time of being immersed in it before I could really begin to see it. And that is, there's the, it, it's the, the tendency that all of us have to think that the way to solve the environmental problems is to frighten the public, is to terrify the public. And it isn't something that anybody openly declared as a strategy. There wasn't a psychologist who said, this is the best kind of environmental messaging. It just started happening. And the, uh, I can trace it back to Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. His, he sort of established the model of how to give that kind of environmental talk, which is a one hour talk and the first 59 minutes are unbelievable doom and gloom, cat catastrophe, apocalypse, the word apocalypse is used 10 or 15 times, climate apocalypse, catastrophe, disaster, 11, 59 and 59 seconds, all of the graphs showing pollution getting going vertical and showing good things going down. And, at, and then in the end, the very last thing is the call to action. And the call to action is, this is actually true, this was the number one item on Al Gore's call to action after Inconvenient Truth. Do you remember it? Pump up your car tires to their full pressure when you go on a road trip. So you get the best gas mileage in your car. And then the next one was change your light bulbs. And so it's an infinitesimally tiny gesture that even if everyone on earth did it, wouldn't make a smidge of a difference. And it's a testament to disempowerment. That kind of call to action is a testament to disempowerment because it's telling, it's telling the listener, I don't trust you or respect you to take the problem seriously enough to actually do anything meaningful. So all of us together, another shot of heroin in our veins, we'll all keep doing exactly what we're doing, keep all of our consumption going exactly as, as we are, but we'll make this one tiny little change that we all know perfectly well isn't gonna accomplish anything. Hmm. And that's the conversation we've been stuck in for 20 years. And it's escalated, especially with climate change. The, the, first it was uh, global warming, then it became climate change and now the standard word that is used by in the New York Times by journalists and scientists is the climate apocalypse. And when all of us in environmental advocates and uh, in, in environmental science, like all of the people who are trying to advocate on behalf of the environment, when, when we speak, we have a tendency to think the reason everybody isn't acting more now is because we haven't terrified them enough. So escalate even further. And everybody got on the bandwagon without ever talking about it with each other and just 
amplified and amplified and amplified until even coming from the world's most respected scientists are these horrible doom and gloom, terrifying messages. And those of us who are my age, I'm 57. I remember the world before that. So we have people my age have a perspective on it, but young people were born into that conversation and they've been hearing for their entire life that the world is going to end in a hundred different ways. And it's coming from a hundred different directions. And the only thing we don't know is, is it going to be this week or next week? And so I, I meet young people all over the world who it absolutely breaks my heart to see they live in a state of existential terror that they're not going to get to live their life. And that is a hundred percent the fault of the environmental movement. But I wouldn't say fault because we are all trying to do the right thing. There's not a bad guy, but I believe now is the time to transcend that broken conversation and know, because we know this from brain scientists, they have done studies of what happens to, the, uh, to someone's brain when they're in a state of terror and we lose the ability to think. And the, the mind collapses in a state of terror and especially in a state of panic, which is the most acute terror. And we literally have world famous environmental activists telling us you should all be panicked about an issue that's gonna last the entire rest of our lives. And so we need to get past this terror message into a wiser conversation where we, we have whole mind intelligence available to ourselves and figure it out without taking our foot off the accelerator pedal, we don't wanna just be like, okay, no problem, everything's fine. We, ha the, we have to have our foot on the accelerator pedal, but we have to stop infusing fear into the collective consciousness around environmentalism. And I don't know how to do it, but I believe that one of the ways is to start to focus on beauty. It's to focus on what we love, like not, we're all so bad that we should save the environment. It's like, look at the, the miracle that we're all a part of the, and we need to take better care of it because it's so beautiful. Anyway, that was a super long rant, but I wanted to deliver it to you guys. So you have that piece of perspective. Yeah, no, th no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Chris. And we don't have a, a huge amount of time. And I want to get a couple more questions. Someone, someone mentioned, and I think this kind of, um, works well with what you just mentioned. And this gets back to uh, your, your comments about albatross and just the, the intense grief that you experienced there. But, but uh, Ellen mentions that sort of punctuated in, in that film are, um, are moments of, of joy and of beauty, the, the birth of the albatross and things like that. So, I mean, is that what you were, were doing for us in that film? And, and did you find that the film was really just the best medium to, to convey that kind of information? Oh, well, yeah, it was, uh, when I started making Albatross, I wasn't a filmmaker. I'd never made a film, never thought I would make a film, never studied film, but it's just so clearly the medium of our time. You can say so much, even in a three minute video. And then reach a vast global audience with it. So I, I realized I had to make a film and it was such an interesting thing. Looking at the medium, the, the, the documentary medium and seeing how narrow most documentary films are in what they deliver. It's like a, a sort of very narrow slice of, of experience that is just a bunch of facts and being out on Midway Island was so much more than just factual. <laughs> it was this incredible sensual experience of, of unbelievable beauty. It's like being in paradise. Imagine being on an island that's just a few football fields in size and there, there are like 4 million birds that live there. And the, you're surrounded by the Pacific Ocean all the time, just these fantastically vivid colors, so much beauty. And, and it was a spiritual experience for me. It was like a, an absolutely life-changing connection with 
with beauty. And I wanted to bring all of that into the documentary art form. And rather than just deliver a set of facts, I wanted to try to give the experience of what it would be like for someone to come with me to the island mm -hmm. and see if I could deliver that, that transformative experience that I had. And I, I also, uh, I, the arc of Albatross was shaped as a medicine ceremony. And so it starts with horror and uh, it, 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 like it starts with the bad news. Um, and, you know, that's the, the, the hard work in a medicine ceremony at the beginning of the ceremony is that if you're working with shamans, there's, there's drumming and there's sweating and, and like doing the, the hard work, going into the fear, going into the darkness, and then slowly moving through that and connecting with, with more and more beauty. And, and then there's an arc that's about empathy. It's connecting with the birds and seeing through their eyes and seeing their sentience and falling in love with them or realizing that we already love them. And then finally moving into grief, which is just the other side of love. The, it's the, the identical twin of love that there, I, I put, uh, four waves of grief that, that each get deeper as we go further into that journey. And so there's some people who don't make it all the way through Albatross and they come out with a bad experience. Like, yeah, it was a horrible movie. But if you make it all the way through, then hopefully you, you come out the other side um, with, with a, I, I intended to make it like a holistic experience. There's a lot of beauty. There's, there's a lot of sadness. There's love. There's the, the, the sacred and the mundane, there's the, the mandala and the angel symbolism and some things that, that sort of hopefully elevated a little bit in juxtaposition to the, the horror of the plastic, which is sort of the ultimate mundane hell of the, of the plastic on the ground. So I tried to make it the widest, broadest, fullest experience that I could that mirrored how it actually was to be out on that island. Wow. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, well, gosh, we don't have a, a huge amount of time and we have so many questions. Um, this, this group has come up with some excellent questions here and I'm just trying to think of- What a great uh, group. I wish we had like four or five hours. I know, I was just thinking the same thing. We need more time <laughs> to get through some of these. Um, Y'all, if anybody on the line has a question that they wanna ask uh, Chris directly, you should uh, feel free, raise your hand and, and turn on your, your microphone and your camera. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to find uh, uh, some good questions or going through these questions to see a, a find a good one um, to kind of end us up with here. Well, it looks like we have a hand up. Uh, let me see who this is. Zach, oh. you wanna, Zach, you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, it's kind of a softball. Um, in <laughs> one of your <laughs> TED Talks, you uh, mentioned that the name of your documentary you're working on right now is going to be named Flamingo. Is that still true or is it going to be named something else? Oh, <laughs> you're the first person who asked me that. Um, the name has changed. Hmm. Um, the, the, the working title that I have right now is Salar, S-A-L-A-R, which is the name of the salt lakes where the flamingos live um, here in Chile. And it's also, that's the place where lithium is being mined. Most of the world's lithium is, is here in Chile in those super high altitude salt lakes. Um, so all of the batteries in our, in our phones and our laptops and Teslas and Priuses and all of that is being mined, or almost all of it is being mined here. So I think I'm gonna call it Solar, but oh. uh, it's going really slowly. Um, I'm not making any progress on it lately. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I saw a question that I loved from Forrest yeah. Graham Baum. Yeah. Oh, you said, Chris, could, could oh, you just, yeah. I, I do have to uh, launch a poll for my students. So I'm going to launch this poll real quick. Um, it's just, it's a part of the, the course assignment. So I, I'm launching this poll, which is just asking them in their own opinion, what is the most important purpose of environmental art? Just one of these things. It's a multiple choice ah, and I know oh, it's not perfect. Cool. But we do need to ask, I do need to ask something. Um, but I do want you to get to Forrest's question because I do think um, it's a good one. 
to ask as well. So I'm gonna just give everyone a chance to answer. And in fact, actually, if you would like to get started on, on uh, Forrest's question, you certainly can. Mm. Well, it's a beautiful question. Um, the question is, uh, you said that solutions are not happening at the scale of the problem. Can we scale love? Like, ah, that goes right to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? Well, this is the thing that I feel the most hopeful about right now. And let's see, where should I start with that? Think of it like this, is all of the problems we have, all of our environmental problems and all of our social problems, they look like they're out there and we have to go out there and solve them. So the Amazon rainforest is burning down. We have to go solve that. Or animals are going extinct in Africa or there's plastic in the ocean. Like we have to go and solve those problems. And in one way that's true. And all of the people in the world, the millions of people who are working at sort of boots on the ground, environmentalists solving those problems are doing incredible work. There's another way you can look at it. And that is that all of those problems out there are symptoms of a problem that is in here. They are like physical manifestations out in the physical world of a problem that begins in our consciousness. It's a, 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 a problem that resides in the morphic field of collective consciousness. And that's where the solution lies. The solution to all of the problems in the world is in our mind, in our consciousness. And that's a super exciting thing because consciousness doesn't follow the, the laws of physics. It's consciousness literally exists in another dimension. And in, in the field of consciousness, there's no time and there's no space and it can change in an instant. Global consciousness could change in an instant and it has many times before. And when you see it that way, this is the way, the, the way that I love to think about it is, especially as, as people interested in environmental communication, you can become like an Aikido master or it's like a superpower to see that the, that the thing that you're working with is a fluid medium that you can influence. And, you, and one person can influence it a lot. And so when you look out and you see a problem like elephants going extinct, that seems like a really hard problem. And you start to study it and see that, the, that there's politics involved and there's violence involved. And, and like it's the, the, the deeper you look, the harder it gets to solve a problem like that. But when you think of it as something that's happening in consciousness, then there's hope that it can change. And every single one of us can make a difference to that. And I believe the way is to connect with love. And I don't mean that in a kind of frou-frou new, new agey way, is I believe we actually are, that, that actually is our essential state of being, is to be in love with the miracle that we're all a part of. And we, we get so, so sort of tunnel vision in our lives thinking I have to get good grades or I have to get a job or I have to make money or I have to whatever thing. But if you can make a practice of just sort of expanding your consciousness, walk outside and be like, what the hell? <laughs> Oh my God, I'm in the universe. I'm alive. I live on a planet. We are actually on a planet. And we've each been given this, this gift of consciousness that we don't even know what it is. 
we are all literally part of the most incomprehensible, incredibly amazing unfolding miracle. And every, every being is part of that. Every insect, every plant, every tree is, is, is incomprehensibly complex and amazing. And this is the teaching that comes from the wisdom teachings from, from religions and from wisdom teachings and from shamans and, and, and wise philosophers from every direction in every language in every culture throughout time. And that's the thing that if we collectively can, can connect with it, can reconnect with it, to remember it and feel it in our bones, that's the thing that is, that's the solution. And so, yes, that can be scaled. And I believe the way, the, the place to begin with each one of us is inside our own heart. And my teacher, the, the Buddhist teacher, Joanna Macy, who I've worked with for years and I have massive respect for, she said, the most powerful form of activism that any of us could ever do is to heal our own heart. Because when we do that, then we become powerful we become free and we, we then begin to shine that energy out to everyone. And, and in that space, the whole world looks different. It's not a disaster. It's not an apocalypse. It's not a catastrophe. Nothing bad is happening. We're living in this amazing miracle in every moment. And yeah, we have problems. Let's solve them. We can do it. Wow. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate it. I think we all appreciate that. I'm realizing that we are out of time. And so uh, with that, I do, I'm going to end the poll and share the results for anybody who cares to see it. Uh, but I do want us all to give Chris Jordan a round of applause uh, for sharing his perspective with us today. Thank you so much, Chris. This has oh. been fantastic. Um, I, I know that I, I got a lot out of it. I know that the students did as well. And I hope that you'll, um, that you'll join us again in the future and that you'll keep us posted on your work. I'm looking really, um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what comes of your, your travels and your, your work you're doing now in Patagonia. Oh, oh I'm loving all your guys' comments. Thank you all so much. <laughs> yeah, thank and, you so um, much. Sean, uh, I have a feeling like I, I, this was too short. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm on Facebook. If people are, are on Facebook and my Instagram is underline, Chris, underline, underline, Jordan, underline, <laughs> um, find me there. And, uh, if you guys, if, if, if any of you want to hang out further and talk or whatever, um, I have lots of free time these days and would be totally happy to Skype or communicate by email or whatever. I see a lot of deeply engaged people here and um, I just want to make myself available to, to, uh, to keep talking um, if you want to. Thank you so much, Chris. That is fantastic. I'm sure that many of these students will take you up on that offer. Um, I am going to turn off the, the YouTube right now. And uh, if anybody on the Zoom has any additional questions for Chris, maybe we'll stick around for just a few minutes. But otherwise, you all have a very great evening. I hope that you take Chris's words to heart um, and uh, take them into the rest of your day. Thank you very much.